go. All right, let's call the meeting to order. This is our February 15, 2023 meeting of the, of the Brown Ranch Annexation Committee. Um, everyone's present today, except Joella, but uh, as we always do, why don't we go around and just introduce everyone for purposes of the transcript. I'm Jason Lacey, third party facilitator. Jason Peasley, Executive Director of the Housing Authority. Robin Krausen, President of City Council. John Snyder, Public Works Director for the City. Kathy? Kathy Meyer, members of Yampa Valley Housing Authority. Leah Wood, President of Yampa Valley Housing Authority Board. Gary Suter, City Manager, Steve Springs. Angela Cosby, Parks and Recreation Director. Everybody back here speak up. So the transcript. Person. Angela Cosby, yeah. Parks and Recreation <laughs> Director. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle Carr, Distribution and Collection Manager. Mike Lane, Communications Manager, City. Rebecca Bessie, Planning Director. Emily Katzman, Development Project Manager for Yampa Valley Housing Authority. Julie Baxter, City Water Resources Manager. Dan Foote, City Attorney. Kim Weber, Finance Director for the City. Gilbert Anderson, Wastewater Plant Superintendent. Oh, and Joella has joined us. I have Joella right. West, City Council. All right, thank you. Okay, um, first on our agenda today is approval of the minutes. As, as we discussed previously, we will be taking a motion to approve the video, which will be considered the minutes for our meeting. Um, but I also wanted to bring up, um, we also are sending out this detailed transcript. And I wanted to get some feedback again from council to see if you wanted to still keep receiving the transcript, if you had a chance to talk about that, or and also get some feedback from the housing authority as well. We're going to keep the transcript. Okay. In addition to the video. Okay. All right. Housing authority, thoughts on that? Our board is not interested in reviewing the detailed transcript. They prefer the meeting summary. Family. Okay. Yeah, and then and then if they want to dive deeper, they'll just go to the video. Yeah, of course. Okay, great. Okay, so the transcript will keep coming, and we'll keep including that in the packet just in case anyone else would like to see it as well. So, okay, and can I get a motion to approve the video of the minutes from February first? So moved. Second. Motion by Leah, second by Kathy. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Um. And then I also, um, I know we were having, I just wanted to bring up um, packet updates. I know we had some rainbow packets and things of that nature, rainbow items coming in late. Did anybody want to discuss how we're receiving those? I believe those were just added to the online agenda and agenda packet. Does anybody have any comments about, do you want emails with that, you know, knowing that that information has been uploaded or how do you want communication on future packet updates? If we don't know that it's there, we don't know that it's there. And it's really irritating to me to have two things put in front of me this morning that I haven't had time to look at. Okay. Especially when some of us do work long days the day before this meeting. Okay. And if we're not at least getting communication by email, and the fact that some people prefer to have packets that are printed, then we don't have the information in a timely manner. And I don't think it should be discussed if we don't all have the information. Okay. Other thoughts on packet updates? And maybe, I don't know if Rebecca or who would to give us an update on how, it, are, is the new, the rainbow packet material is just being added online and are we, we're not, I didn't see any notifications about uh, material being uploaded. Is that? Uh, we can ask the clerk's office to do, I mean, if we want to email when those things get added, like, we can do that. Okay. Okay. Maybe we should do that to make sure everyone knows new material has been added. I think the there should be a time limit. Maybe it's noon on Monday. If it's not done by noon on Monday or noon on Tuesday, you can't expect to get something on Tuesday afternoon and be able to go through it. Especially in a week where it's a, there's a city council meeting on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I yeah, have a suggestion. There sure. have been some things that we've received that don't have author or date stamp. Okay. So it's not obvious to me who was the author. Okay. And so um, I think, uh, um, for example, um, I think it was your report that I, I assumed it came from you, but it might have come from really other people. You did put a date on it and very early. 
but I it's helpful to know who wrote it and who contributed. I don't care if somebody edited minors, minor edits. Okay, sure. All right, fair enough. So going forward, we'll make sure any written material has author information and we'll try to, if the clerk's office could send an email update whenever there's new information loaded. That would be. That would help the group. And then is the Monday at noon sort of the ex There's the gotta be some drop dead date on this stuff. Right. Yeah, because a lot of our meetings are on Wednesday morning after a Tuesday night city yeah. council meeting. Sure. And from noon on Tuesday on, you don't have an opportunity to sometimes even look at email, let alone read, mm -hmm. whether it's two pages or ten. Right, right. And to mm -hmm. be able to ask questions or whatever else. Yeah. So noon on Monday to me sounds like a great idea. I understand, Robin. I was concerned from these compressed turnaround times from the very beginning that mm -hmm. this would result. And I think this is how it's manifested itself. With with uh, deadlines, Rebecca not only has, for example, council meetings, but she also has planning commission meetings and you throw this in there, all these deadlines overlapping one another. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just not possible to get the material out that you need to get out. So and we did we did discuss, I remember in our first meeting that we knew there would be some rainbow material, so I think it's just important, and I think that will continue. But certainly, if we want to set a deadline for what, when any any new material needs to be in, let's let's do that. Yeah, because we've produced, I mean, we'll be producing the packet for the next meeting tomorrow, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, and so I saw that. No, the no, idea no. the idea that that new information can come in. I mean, I, yeah, I think there's it's good to have a drop dead date that way we're all coming into this meeting fairly. Mm -hmm. So, is the group comfortable with noon on Mondays before these meetings or something else? Does that sound good? It, it, it does for me. I, I, I'd like to be able to actually read and focus on something rather sure. than scanning it to right. see and never actually going through it in a Monday afternoon. Okay. I agree. Monday and noon works for me. Happy. Yes, Monday. Yeah. Okay. And if we know there's something coming to let us know, you know, this is the packet, but it's missing the following things and you can expect it by a certain date. Mm -hmm. The more information you can give us, we can be looking for it. Yep. That's a really good mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Staff, any other clarity you need on that? Okay. Thank you. Um, Last thing, just to kind of as a follow up to the last meeting, I brought up this idea of whether or not um, a third party expert might be needed to help the parties with making sure we had a good annexation agreement and implementation of the annexation agreement. Sounds like the Housing Authority was one step ahead of me um, because uh, yesterday I saw you sent out your or posted your RFQ. Uh, did you want to just tell us briefly about that and kind of what you're looking for as far as that RFQ goes? Yeah. So. So this would be essentially an implementation partner for the housing authority on right. the development of, of Brown Ranch. So uh, in lieu of the housing authority going out and, and scaling up our staff to have the capacity to do fairly large land development, we would be bringing in a partner that has experience doing that okay. um, to help us execute on that, limit risk, mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, cut off the learning curve of it takes to do all of that, um, get some advice on how it's done, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how it's done right, if that makes sense from their standpoint. Um, and so we've put that out. This was actually a recommendation from the Urban Land Institute when right. I came out in December. Right. Um, and, you know, prior to that, we were sort of thinking that we might try to do this all in-house from, um, uh, from the housing authority side, mm -hmm. but they're their suggestion was, was a good one, and, and we've sort of switched course since then. So we've put out an RFQ um, that is uh, intended to sort of cast a relatively wide net to bring in developer partners. Mm -hmm. Part of that interview process that we'll be doing will be actually, you know, we'll have this, we'll have at least some version of the annexation agreement available for those folks to review because public document, we're trying to be looking at it anyway, um, to get some feedback through that process. And then uh, our goal would be to then narrow it down to a short list of folks that would be submitting a proposal to actually be our fee developer partner in this in this case. Mm -hmm. And um, we have that selected sometime in the middle of the summer. 
Okay. So we talked about this sort of concept uh, as we were approving that RFQ at the board meeting, and everyone said, well, we're already doing this. So I don't yeah. think we need to. Mm -hmm. Robin and, and Joella, as from the city perspective, do you think would there be any value to you in having a developer, some kind of development type partner? And I, I wouldn't envision maybe the city would need someone through development of the of, you know the whole Brown Ranch project, but it, somebody to who who has that development experience who could look at the annexation agreement, maybe not maybe not now in the beginning, but maybe later on to say. Gee, this looks good. Or here are some holes you're missing. Here are some concerns. Here are some things I've seen go wrong, et cetera. Would that be of value to the city? Well, personally, I, I would love to see that. We've, we've tossed that idea around um, because the, no matter how good your uh, development partner is, it's always going to be regarded as your development partner, which you should be. That's that's yours. So if we're just looking for advice from here until the ideal date at the end of June, mm -hmm. um, that's I think very different. Although somebody with that wide experience is also somebody that I think we would dream about. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, whoever you're bringing on board is long term and has your best interests at heart, and we need someone more neutral mm -hmm. or more leaning towards the city for us at this moment in time to ensure that our interests are met. Okay. Okay. So do you want to talk to council about putting out a similar or, or RFQ for your needs, or Gary, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we should have that discussion. City council. Okay. So you'll discuss that with council and come back, discuss okay. with us. Okay. I would just like to say from our perspective, I think we've been really collaborative in these meetings so far. So I'm hoping that as you engage another party to bring into this meeting, that we can make it clear sort of the collaborative nature of the city and the housing authority as we work together in these negotiations. Uh, so that partner, while they may be you know fed to the city side or have you know your best interest at heart, you know, our development partner is really trying to execute our plan, which yeah. is our community plan, which is a plan that we're all working on in collaboration. So I, our concern with bringing another party into this negotiation is that I think that the meetings have been productive and the tone has been really collaborative and wonderful so far. So I just would hope that that would continue. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason for it not to. Yeah, right. I think we just want another set of eyes looking at it. Sure. With the qualification, <laughs> when we put out the RFQ, it has to be, we don't need a, somebody who is adversarial by nature. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. No, I think the it's been pretty obvious throughout this whole process that we're all trying to get to the same goal. So I think as long as we keep that spirit, yeah. we'll be fine. We have, we have to answer to all the citizens of this city um, some of whom may not be huge fans some of whom may be very skeptical about whether this will work um, one of the ways that we can help i think is to have that set of eyes yeah. okay great then we can follow up on that again let city council discuss okay thanks everyone um <clears throat> item two on prior meeting recap is the community outreach plan um, I understand that between our last meeting and, and now, um, the parties, city and the and housing authority parties were able to meet and discuss an updated plan with some, with maybe reduced advocacy. Um, so I don't know, Mike, or who, who would like to introduce that updated plan? It doesn't matter to me. We met. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted to discuss it today since it came in after your deadline. Or... Yeah, does the group feel comfortable? Discussing that today, or do you want to wait until the next meeting? Well, I'm sure that a presentation would be nice, but I don't want to make a decision today because it's not even something we discuss with council. Okay. Okay. Would you want, would the group want to at least see the updated proposal and then we could follow up on it next week or in two weeks? Yeah, that's great. Yes. Okay. Because so, then we have more information to take back. Okay. We can, the proposal you have in the rainbow is the joint one put together by the Housing Authority and the city has some updated financial numbers associated with it um, that we'll need you to take a look at and see if you're comfortable with those. Um, 
Okay. Happy to email it out to this group. Okay. And I think the the point of of collaborating on the sort of outreach component was was that it's one message coming from the Brown Ranch Annexation Committee out to the community, being delivered via a variety of different outlets and methods. Um, and so the idea being that, you know, however, however we get to this agreement on this, it's Brown Ranch Annexation Committee's scope. We agree on who's delivering out the messaging and it's all consistent, if that makes sense. So it's not, you know, you get sort of a slightly different version coming from the city, a slightly different version coming from the housing authority. It's all just the same content being pushed out. Um, and so the, the scope there is related to getting information out in a variety of different methods um, so that we can hit the broadest swap in the community. And so, I, fair statement. so two things. Number one, it would be good for us to have the original to take back to council the original that you have worked up, Mike. Mm -hmm. And so that we can compare what the city would have planned on doing with what the collaborative plan is. And if somebody wants to go through this for five minutes or something and give us the overview of what's changed and what's been added. Okay. But for, for anyone who had a chance to take a look at the at the updated plan, any questions or comments from the group? Okay. Did you get Kathy so, or Leah? Did you get a chance to look at it? So we need a presentation on this. We need to understand what the city wanted to do. We understand what the proposal was. Okay. And now let's see how it meshed together and what are we getting. Okay. And does everybody feel comfortable with it? Was that is that what the group would like to see? Maybe at the next meeting we can put this in prior meeting recap. Makes sure. sense. Sure. Okay. All right. Yeah, it sounds like a, a real presentation is needed, so it might actually need to be an actual just topic item. Agenda. Yeah. Um, so it can be a more robust mm -hmm. presentation. Well, and I th I think in some of these prior meeting recap sections, I think we will have some pretty robust discussion. I think particularly next time, I would envision that the, the meeting recap on today's topic will be very robust, would be my guess. Um, so, so I, I mean, I, I don't okay, care where we put it. My, yeah, so we can just keep, I think we can keep it in the prior meeting recap and then maybe we could just plan on a five, 10 minute presentation and then we can get some feedback from the group. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Um, so we won't do a motion on, on that one today because we wait for the presentation. Um, so let's move to agenda item three. That's the general plan of development, which we discussed at the, which we spent most of the time last meeting discussing. And we have the um, working draft of the annexation agreement that the housing authority put together. And I think for today, what I'd like to do and, and going forward, I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with the working draft. So I'll be looking for a motion to approve that working draft as it stands. Obviously, as things develop throughout the process, that, that this is not binding. This is just to signify your agreement with the document as it exists right now, based on the information we have at the moment. But before we ask for a motion, I just I'll probably ask every time, <clears throat> is there anything in this agreement that's a non starter, any unacceptable provisions, anything that made you feel uncomfortable based on the way the working draft reads right now? I'm assuming the answer is no for the housing authority since they produced the first draft. <clears throat> but from the city perspective, any any specific concerns with the working draft? And you're talking about the development plan. <laughs> Talking about the annexation agreement. The annexation agreement itself. The working draft. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I need to go back in and reread it. I have, I have, I have no big concerns of any kind. Mm -hmm. I, I want to make very sure that the language in there that spells out how many, which one, how many, what kind of. Um, it's very clear that there is flexibility in that, as, as Jason has said all along, 
but there need to be, I think, some some guardrails around that once the annexation is complete and and there will still be lots of time for conditions to change at what point does the city have need to get involved in adjustments in which one how many what kind of or for that matter even where yes so for me to approve this today with lots of blank spaces on items we haven't discussed yet it doesn't make sense to do this annexation well i mean for, for me i think i think the whole purpose is just to make sure that just knowing what we have now you're you're okay with what you see obviously as things change numbers get filled in that you know language changes with new sections etc your your opinion might change but I, I feel like from my perspective it feels like it would be helpful to know that what we have in front of us at the moment is the, is acceptable or or not I, I'm still lost. Are you looking for a, 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 an approval of the entire document or just those portions that we've discussed? After just the portions we've discussed, which which all we have discussed really is this general plan of development and the kind of working skeleton draft of the annexation agreement. That's all we have. We have lots of sections still to fill in. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so. So that was my thought is, you know, each time we meet as part of the prior meeting recap, we would take a look at the working draft of the annexation agreement and say, this looks good, or here are the, you know, one, two, three, however many items that we still have concerns about and we need to focus on and, and work on. That's where I think we would focus discussion on prior meeting recap, if there are still open items that we have concerns with. Well, that's you have my note on it. So, subject to that note, mm -hmm. I am absolutely fine. I, but I'm only speaking for for whatever fifty percent I'm representing. Yeah. The day. Right. Right. I and mean, the only thing for me is we had a very general discussion because we told with council because we said this is just an initial conversation, mm -hmm. um, and we did not convey to them that we would be approving in theory the general plan of development at our next meeting because we had so much more to go through so i would like to at least hold off until our next meeting so that on the tuesday night before our meeting we can make it perfectly clear that we are being asked to generally agree with this mm -hmm. and and have the um the ability to do that through their um consensus and approval as well okay and I mean, like I said, these are not, this isn't a binding vote. This is really just for purposes of this committee to feel like we're making the progress we like. We, we like what we see so far. Obviously, as new topics come in, new sections of the agreement are started, you know, begin to be drafted. Um, your thoughts on the overall agreement may change based on, you know, because what, you know, the direction you go in some areas might influence you know, the, the, you know, your feelings on other sections of the annexation agreement. So I don't view this as, you know, any kind of binding, you know, there's no turning back type of vote. This is really more just your confirmation as a committee that what you see right now looks good and that you're comfortable with it. And you, you know, obviously things can change as, as topics develop over time, but I think I just like to get some kind of confirmation that we're progressing in the right direction. Okay. That's really what I'm looking for. Because I'm just, just looking at the phasing plan. You know, it's at the first phase one will consist of 1,100 to 1,200 units. But we're going to talk today about the fact that we need to do a lot of infrastructure changes before 800 units are done. So then I'm kind of saying, yeah, this is okay. But yet, in fact, today we're going to have a conversation that says this probably won't work. So I need help. And Robin, I, in terms of the general feeling, of the uh, the structure of the annexation agreement, I reading it through once, uh, I was fine with it. I thought it it had all the basic components in there looked fine. I viewed it as uh, comparing it to a meal as a light appetizer. Mm -hmm. We still have to get to the entrees and the meat and potatoes. And, and the entrees okay. start today. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> no, so given the structure, I'm kind of I'm fine with how it's set up. But I looked at all that and thought, boy, these are going to be some some big uh, long bridges to cross here right. as we get into the uh, to the heavier topics. So I was fine with that, and uh, 
but yeah, there's it's when we get to the meat and potatoes, it's it's going to present some challenges, I'm sure. Right. Okay. I think that I think the word approval is probably the one that's that's giving both of us pause. Okay. Um. Well, we did yeah. we did at our organizational meeting say we were going to take motions mm -hmm. and yes. follow kind of yes. standard meeting protocol, yeah. and yeah. that's so. Again, you're not. This isn't a city council collective vote that you know that that comes later when the approval or not of the annexation agreement comes to me this is just you know as we move along i think it is important for both sides to confirm what we have in front of us as of now seems to be on point that could change over time as different sections develop and, and different topics come up but i i just think some kind of confirmation that we're on the right track as of now is important So with that, um, happy to entertain a motion on, um, you know, the confirmation that the annexation working draft of the annexation agreement as it is currently presented is is accepted. For the general plan of development section three. Yeah, yeah, that's all we have right now. And that would be A through C. Right on the draft. Those are the those are the only substantive sections we have as of now. And two of you are welcome to make a motion too. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that council was comfortable with whatever we were talking about. They were approving for. You know, we drafted the language, so I would make a motion that I'm comfortable with the language that it is so far. And I second that with the caveat that it will be the expectation that it will change over time of course. as we move through uh, the meat and potatoes topics. Mm -hmm. Which start next. Yes. Right. <laughs> All, right. All right, that's a motion by Leah, a second by Kathy. Any other discussion on that motion? Okay, all the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, passes unanimously. All right, and that brings us to today's current discussion, which is item four. This is city services, operations, and maintenance responsibilities. Um, and, and John, I think you're gonna lead this discussion. Sure. Before we dive into that, um, I did wanna make sure I understood, <clears throat> I didn't see an update to the annexation agreement draft in right. here and is that i assume that's purposeful I mean, we had discussed that we would be updating this as we move along but i assume you need some key input from the group and particularly the your city colleagues exactly. uh, before you make a proposal is that yes, that's correct. okay so then the plan would be hopefully we get some movement and on the discussion today especially on the key questions and then for the next meeting in the follow-up, we'll have an updated annexation agreement draft with these sections included? Uh, potentially, either that or it will come in our April discussion when we have a warrant of mandatory. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and it's just, you know, with the, the tight timeline that I've right. been given here, I know this, you know, I just want us to make sure we're staying on top of moving the annexation agreement draft along because, you know, I know it's only February, but June will come pretty quickly. So hopefully we can get some movement on these key entree meaty discussion items today and and then update that draft as, as soon as we can. Yeah. Okay. All right, John. Well, with that, uh, let you take it away and give us a presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, again, John Snyder, Public Works Director. And uh, with me here, we did offer the material in your packet, just in will, we'll make sure we clarify that in the future. Uh, with me here today, uh, we have several staff members. We have Gilbert Anderson, who is the Wastewater Treatment Plant Superintendent. We have Julie Baxter, who is our Water Resources Manager. And in particular, this discussion, she'll be our expert in uh, water conservation and storm water. And then we have Michelle Carr, who is our distribution and collection manager. And in this discussion, um, she's our expert in uh, basically treatment and delivery. So um, as far as expectations for today, these are the meaty topics or the beginning of the meaty topics. What staff's intention was, was to 
give the committee an introduction to these topics. Most of the introduction is in the packet material. Uh, the packet material is long, so I won't uh, go into great detail on the packet material today, uh, but we'll try to focus the discussion on what needs to be in the annexation agreement as we move forward. But again, I don't think you're gonna be in a position to make decisions today but hopefully this prepares you to uh, start forming your positions uh, for future discussion. Quick question, John. Yes. How important is the water demand analysis in uh, informing our ultimate decision on this? Great question. Uh, I understand that will be presented to this group in April, and that really is the foundational document, especially from a legal perspective, that we're gonna be using for this annexation. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I'll just say going into this that we were running off the assumption that the city was, uh, if, if this annexation was approved, that the city were going to be providing uh, water services and wastewater services. So we'll just say that right off the bat. We did not create this assuming that there was going to be a uh, third water district in the city. Okay. So our first slide here, just a vicinity map to get everybody uh, oriented. Um, in particular, I um, wanted to remind everybody uh, watching online that uh, the city is comprised of two water districts, the Mount Werner Water District, which is basically south of Fish Creek, and then the city district, which is, for the most part, north of Fish Creek. Our analysis was mindful of both districts because the two districts are intertwined. Um, however, the uh, demand modeling projection uh, projections we are running is specifically for the city district because if this gets annexed, it will be the city's responsibility to provide these services, not Mount Warner's. But we have to do so in a way that does not harm Mount Warner. It's also worth noting that you see Steamboat 2 out there on the far left of the screen. We do augment Steamboat 2 with uh, 150 plus thousand gallons of water per day through a water main that traverses through the Brown Ranch property. And again, uh, questions at any point, feel free to speak up and stop me. Now, in preparation for uh, these negotiations, staff did our best to articulate what we believe are the community's biggest questions. And uh, I have them up here on the screen, and these were uh, front and center in your packet. Now, question number one here, is there a reliable and secure supply of water? The city is obligated by law to answer that question before we can approve development. Now, it's worth noting that it does not have to be prior to annexation, but it does have to be prior to development. There is a state statute that requires the city to make a finding that there is an adequate water supply before it uh, will approve a development. We also have a municipal ordinance and a pair of municipal ordinances really. And one of those municipal ordinances is a water rights dedication policy, which requires new development to either dedicate water rights or bring water rights, uh, dedicate water rights for the development or pay a fee in lieu. Now that uh, is not a state statute. So it is entirely uh, within council's discretion to decide whether or not they want to do that. Uh, questions two and three, um, there's a big six, uh, six projects or six categories of projects that are necessary to serve the proposed annexation. And uh, we're gonna cover four of those in the next slide. And then question number four here, I believe this is going to be your toughest decision as an annexation committee. Um, I would, for the most part, in fact, I think uh, we're in alignment with the development team right now about what infrastructure needs to be constructed. But uh, the debatable part of that is who pays for what. And then uh, lastly, number five, um, I'm happy to say I think we're in pretty good alignment with aspiring to have this be a uh, very water conscious development. And we do have some suggestions that the committee could consider for the annexation agreement, which we'll go over. So um, this table here uh, hopefully summarizes some of the infrastructure that's needed to make this a reality, what those costs and what the thresholds are. I mentioned in the last slide, there's a big six. Here I'm mentioning, I'm showing four. The two that are not on here are the West Area Water Tank and the Infiltration Gallery Expansion. The reason these are not on this list is because they'll be completed before this annexation agreement would be done. They're, uh, They'll be completed this year, so they're kind of a moot point 
although they are highly necessary for this to be a success. So um, let's take them one by one. Uh, a booster station near the West Area Water Tank. So uh, West Area Water Tank, for those of you who don't know, is a tank that uh, was substantially completed last year. It's up by the airport, uh, kind of off of game trails lane in the county. And uh, it can fill about halfway full right now uh, based off of current demands. However, once we start building Brown Ranch, we will need a booster station in order to fill that tank completely. Now, uh, that is funded currently by the city of Steamboat Springs in our six-year enterprise fund CIP, and we estimate that to cost $1.2 million. That would need to be online before any EQRs out there are occupied, and I've got a detailed slide on EQR coming up next. So again, a booster station near the West Area Water Tank, $1.2 million currently funded by the city. The next is the redundant delivery pipeline along US 40. This was a point of discussion with the Brigger annexation for those involved in that discussion. That is the pipeline that, uh, 12 inch pipeline that runs from roughly Snowville to uh, the KOA campground uh, for redundant delivery uh, service through uh, and to that zone. Um, we currently have the project designed uh, and we plan to build it as part of the core trail project. So it basically goes underneath the core trail. And so when we build the core trail, we'll also build the water line. We estimate it to cost $1 million. The money is currently appropriated and ready to go. So as soon as the grant funding comes in for the core trail, we will build that delivery pipeline. Again, has to be in prior to any new EQRs, but I would certainly anticipate that gets built uh, next summer. John, does that create a loop system then? That's exactly what it does. It Thank will you. create the opportunity for a loop system. Um, this third one here, that's the big one. That is the Elk River water supply. And when I say water supply, I'm talking about a treatment plant, a raw water diversion, uh, pumps, the whole nine yards. That's the big one. Uh, estimated costs right now are anywhere between 40 and 58 million. And that needs to be online uh, by 800 EQRs. And when I say uh, 800, I'm talking about new EQRs outside of the existing city limits. Um, and we arrived at that uh, through distribution system model. It, we have, uh, and the packet mentions this, there's five different thresholds that limit capacity. And it's our distribution system delivery capacity that is the, uh, the first uh, threshold that we bump up against. So that is at 800 EQRs. And then lastly, we have all the on-site infrastructure, and that's uh, pipelines, pump stations, pressure reducing valves, all that kind of stuff. That will come online as development progresses, as the neighborhoods get built out. And the way the... Uh, uh, housing Authority has presented it so far in the way the annexation agreement currently reads is that would be funded by the uh, developer with potential uh, STR uh, tax money and grants and funded by the developer would be consistent with what we do in the rest of the city. So let's talk about EQR real quick because it's important everybody understands EQR for this discussion. Uh, and EQR does not equal a dwelling unit. Uh, everybody needs to understand that right off the bat. So when we say a house or an apartment, uh, that does not necessarily equal an EQR. <laughs> now, um, many communities model their present demands and their future demands on a per capita unit basis. Per capita is not a particularly useful unit to use in resort communities like Steamboat. We have a large uh, demand from tourists and visitors that we have to account for. We also have a large influx of daily transient workers. That would be somebody like me who lives in Hayden, so I wouldn't be counted on a per capita basis, but I come to Steamboat every day and use the water system. So we have to account for transient workers. And we also have to account for a highly fluctuating seasonal demand. So in order to come up with a common unit to do all of our modeling, we develop what we call an equivalent residential unit. Now, conceptually, the easiest way to think of this is a 2,500 square foot house, uh, three beds, two baths, and a yard. That's how you can think of an EQR. But uh, more importantly, on a granular level, what staff thinks of it uh, uh, is 140 fixture unit points. 
Uh, and what I mean by a fixture unit point, it's a plumbing term uh, for how you try to rate the demand that a given attribute of a property will have on a plumbing system. For instance, a toilet in somebody's house is assessed as 8.1 fixture unit points. So when we go through an EQR, we count up all the fixtures, all their different assessments on the plumbing system, and we come up with fixture unit points. Conversely, if you have a public toilet, that is assessed at 16.2 fixture unit points. So that's how EQRs can be used to account, uh, account for visitors, transient workers, all that kind of stuff. So again, at a staff level, we use 140 fixture unit points, and that's what uh, the housing authority is using for their water demand report. But conceptually, think of it, of it as a 2,500 square foot single family residence. What this means then is if you have an apartment unit or a condo unit that is two bedrooms, one bath, you're probably somewhere at about 0 0.25, 0 0.3 EQOs. So you can fit a lot more units if they are smaller multifamily units. And John, maybe that I think that's an important point to emphasize because on your previous slide, you showed the kind of trigger for the the plant upgrade to be the 800 EQRs. That's not 800 units, especially considering this development looks like it will be primarily multifamily and single family detached, probably much smaller units than what we're talking about as an EQR here. That's absolutely right. Right. That's okay. absolutely right. And the value of using this EQR based system is it, it allows you to be flexible with what kind of developments you want to bring in. It can be a park with soccer fields, and you can convert that to an EQR model. It can be a store, it can be a, an apartment building, it can be a single family house. So, uh, to make decisions on how you're going to fund all these things, it's important to understand that the water utilities and the wastewater utilities are Tabor Enterprise funds. Now, the stormwater uh, system is not the Tabor Enterprise Fund. We'll talk about stormwater at the end, but water and wastewater are Tabor Enterprise Funds. Uh, they receive no tax dollars. So the general fund does not contribute to the water and sewer fund. Um, the revenue comes entirely from two places, monthly customer bills. That's the bill that comes every month and you pay based off how much water you use. And then plan investment fees, more commonly known as TAP fees, and that's what's paid at the time of building permit application. And the amount of the TAP fee is uh, entirely dependent on the uh, intensity of use that you're proposing to build. The must monthly customer bills are des designed to pay for operations, maintenance, which uh, would include personnel, replacements. So it uh, they do pay for uh, capital replacements anytime we replace a water line or replace components at the plant. That all comes from monthly customer bills, as well as uh, upgrades, especially state mandated upgrades. So when the state comes in and says, hey, you need to increase your treatment level at the water plant, that all comes from monthly customer bills. So for replacements, John, does that include uh, water meters, the remote water meters? Like that type of program? It does. Okay. Yep. Thanks. That's absolutely right. <clears throat> Plant investment fee fees, TAP fees, are designed to pay for capacity. So that's system expansions. That can be either expansions of uh, the distribution and collection systems, or it can be expansions of the plants. So uh, TAP fees are meant to pay for things that enable you to grow, that, that make things bigger. Uh, as I mentioned, they are collected once. They're collected at billing permit application, and then that's it. We never collect tap fees on that particular property again, unless they apply for another building permit. Uh, the way we assess it is we have a big spreadsheet, and we use those fixture unit points that I talked about last time, and uh, we basically count all the plumbing fixtures, the quantity of square footage, the size of the yard, all that kind of stuff. And that spits out our number for tap fees. If you plug in 140 fixture unit points to this spreadsheet, you will get about $12,150 for your water tap fee and about $6,950 for your wastewater tap fee. And then with that, Let's take a closer look at the Elk River Supply Project, because this is really the heart of the discussion. 
for the Elk River Supply, which again needs to be online by the 800 EQR in Brown Ranch, we anticipate the capacity of that plant to be 3.5 million gallons per day. Uh, to put it in perspective, that is substantially smaller than the Fish Creek plant, but it's the same size as the Yampa Wellfield plant. Um, we projected these costs out to 2028 because that's the earliest we think we would begin construction. And we anticipate anywhere from 40 million to $58 million for total construction. And so that includes everything that I have up here, the raw water diversion that's located at the Elk River, um, the pump station to pump the water up the hill, the raw water delivery pipeline, the treatment plant, the clear well. A clear well is a form of water tank that sits right next to a water plant that gives you residence time. And then the treated water distribution lines to get the water from the plant down into town. Uh, annual operating costs, we're looking at just under $650,000. And then um, assuming town continues to build out at its same rate and assuming that Brown Ranch builds out at kind of what uh, Jason mentioned last meeting, we would be looking at having this online and operational by the, uh, by the year 2030. Now, how you pay for this is probably something that you're going to want to identify in the annexation agreement. So when we talk about uh, the real uh, goal of this committee, which is to come up with a draft annexation agreement, how you pay for the Oak River probably should be a clause somewhere in that. Now, the question of how do you uh, divvy up the costs for the Elk River supply, you can kind of think of there's three general ways that uh, you could do this. Number one here, you can assume Brown Ranch and the developers and residents within Brown Ranch cover 100% of the costs uh, through tap fees, through uh, STR tax, through grants, through monthly bills, whatever. Um, Number two, you could keep rates within Brown Ranch consistent with rates within the rest of the city and the city's district. This is how the agreement currently reads in Section 3E. Um, and this is the way that we have always done it in the city. And then number three here is a hybrid, which is uh, you could basically divvy up the cost based off the distribution system model. Now, let me be very clear here that uh, staff does not advocate or uh, recommend option number one. Uh, we do not think that is the right way to go. We do not think that's the fair way to go. And the reason is, is because uh, water systems are integrated. And when I say integrated, uh, it's a pressurized system that's uh, all tied together. So an element in one part of town impacts another part of town and vice versa. So um, though Elk River, the Elk River supply would be, the trigger would be the construction of Brown Ranch, the Elk River supply would inevitably benefit the existing city as well as uh, Mount Vernon Water District. Um, you know, right now, as we mentioned in that one slide, we have two water supplies. We have the Fish Creek supply and we have the Elk River supply. Um, Anybody that believes we will not have a wildfire in the Fish Creek drainage basin at some point is probably fooling themselves. Uh, it's, it, it's likely to happen. When it happens, uh, the amber wellfield supply becomes a primary supply, but it can only support uh, indoor and limited outdoor water, um, which makes Elk River supply particularly important from a resiliency standpoint. So uh, again, staff would not recommend we go with option number one. Um, option number two is clean, it's simple, it, uh, it, it is consistent with the way we've always funded things in Steamboat Springs and that we've never assessed one particular area uh, more money for major structure than we assess another area. Number three here is uh, the compromise though. And what we can do, and we could probably have this taken care of by uh, early May, is we can model uh, a full build out scenario and where the water is actually going from the Elk River supply uh, to Brown Ranch versus the red rest of the city. And maybe it comes up to a two thirds, one third split. Maybe we're able to say, okay, a third of the water is going to the rest of the city, two thirds of the water is going to Brown Ranch. I don't know, I'm just guessing, but that could be a way 
uh, if you wanted to try to find some sort of meaningful solution. Um, of course, you, the city council could uh, decide to use STR tax to offset some of this, and we will explore every grant opportunity we can. Um, but in the scheme of things, I would not recommend that you rely on grants to save the day here. Uh, we might get lucky and get two to four million dollars worth of grants, but that's certainly not going to change the discussion when you're talking 40 to 50 million dollars. Um, water conservation. We do have a water conservation plan that's been adopted by council that's on the books that aims to achieve a 10% reduction in water cons consumption over the next 10 years. In addition to the water conservation plan, which if Brown Ranch is annexed would be also be subject to the water conservation plan. These are six other suggestions that you could consider and you could consider putting them into uh, the uh, annexation agreement or giving guidance to the development teams to consider these with future uh, land development applications. And then uh, as we start to wrap up water, I'll bring up these five key questions again. Um, is there a reliable and secure supply of water to serve the proposed annexation? Now, again, we will be able to uh, finalize that answer, hopefully the water demand report is out now, but I will say based off of previous calculations and modeling that the city has done, uh, and then preliminary uh, modeling and calculations that Brown Ranch has done, I'm pretty confident the answer to that question is going to be yes, uh, especially because we did secure a 1,200 acre feet perpetual storage contract out of Steamboat Lake back in 2021. So uh, this was the major tripping point for all previous annexations. Uh, not really the tripping point now, but everybody does have to understand that uh, elk river supply has to be online before we go up, uh, over 800 EQRs. What infrastructure improvements are necessary? Again, we have that table. We have those four major uh, projects or categories of projects uh, that answer or hope to answer two and three. Um, but number four is really uh, the challenging decision that this committee has to make. Um, again, I wouldn't expect that the committee will be able to answer that question today, but you can start forming your positions on the next couple of months. And with that, I'll wrap up water and turn over to questions before we move on to waste water. If that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, any questions, Kathy or Leah, on the water presentation? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I'm going back to kind of water 101. Let's start at the beginning. What additional capacity does the city have for water storage up either at Long or um, Fish Creek Fish Reservoir? Creek Reservoir? Uh, it's pretty extensive. It's, it far exceeds the 800 EQRs. So we have no issue with currently storage what we have a problem with is if there was a fire correct the impact of of the of those mm -hmm. so because i was told a long time ago in the month of may we let the equivalent of a year's worth of use yeah. flow down the it in other words should we be looking at as a community anyway uh expanding the that capacity or have you looked at that lately so we can the we can add about another 60% of capacity out of Fish Creek. And we wouldn't need to increase the size of the reservoirs, but the size of the plant. So right now the plant has 10 different uh, filtration bays. The most we can go up to is 16. Now, uh, Mount Werner has first rider refusal on four of those, and the city has first rider refusal on two of those. Okay. So I'm kind of starting at the top and working my way through. Yeah. Um, what number is the city using for full build out of the current city limits as far as capacity? Do you remember off the top of your question? No, I'd have to look at the water supply master plan, but we do have that number. I can't recall. I like that because it, the question is, if I remember going back years ago, um, it assumed uh, a lot of infill and whether or not those 
assumptions are on track, high, low, because that all builds into whether that 800 EQR number is correct. Well, and, and maybe on that point, I see in your presentation in your in your memorandum, John, the 800 EQRs is really based on delivery capacity yes. limitations. Whereas if we were just looking at treatment and supply issues, we're, we'd be more at 1700. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. okay. My, my third question okay. is what can we do from a cost effective basis to increase the distribution before we have to add? I mean, are there any other things, alternatives we can do as a community? Um, to increase the capacity increase distribution, distribution capacity. We've done the three major ones already. So uh, we, back in 2012, we put in a 12 inch water main from Howellson to Fairview. Uh, that's 2000. 2012, we increased the uh, trunk line that runs down 13th Street. And then we're finishing up the West Area water tank. So those, the 800 EQRs was assuming those weren't completed. And they were also assuming full build out at city. Uh, once those three, uh, with those three items, I actually suspect we're closer to a thousand eight kilos. So, but that gives us a, a, a factor of safety just in case we're a little late on delivering the plan. Okay. Kathy, to answer your question about the infill, so the 2010 um, analysis, yeah, yeah it anticipated that there would be 45. Roughly 4,500 EQRs of infill that was from 2010 to full build out to the city. Now, I'm almost certain that I gave the build out numbers to the consultant here. So you might want to double check that. Uh, See how accurate they are. Yeah. <laughs> um, Especially since it's been 12 years. Well, yeah. And it was based on an infill study that I had done for Steve Wilson 100. Yeah. Um, Here's the picture, John. Um, so, uh, but it's it's all all of that is within the sort of master plan analysis that I think is feeding into what you're talking about. Okay, so we'll get to we'll get an update of that, but whether that number was good, bad, or a high, low, I'm not sure. So when we evaluated that number in 2019, when we did the water supply master plan, we we vetted that against what we have as far as available raw water capacity and treatment capacity. And we were, were able to serve that with our raw water capacity and treatment capacity. We're able to serve full build out of the city, including the additional EQRs uh, of 4,000 at in the West area. So, um, and that was, and that was looking at between 2019 and 2040, assuming that that's when full build out would happen. Okay, so <clears throat> as far as raw water supply and treatment capacity, we uh, have no concerns about um, supplying a full build out. It's just the infrastructure uh, to get it there. The distribution. Yeah. Okay. If Brown Ranch was delayed or never happened, what are the kinds of things that are in your six year CIP plan that you're already planning on spending money for? Uh, a large part of it is pipeline replacements. Okay. Uh, a typical pipeline should have a lifespan of between 60 and 80 years, depending on when it was built, what material it was built out of. So we spend over a million dollars a year just replacing pipelines. Uh, we also have a lot of plant upgrades that we spend a great deal of money on. As far as new infrastructure, again, uh, we are planning to do that pipeline around uh, along Highway 40 regardless. And we made that decision after Sleepy Bear started having their water problems because this could serve Sleepy Bear if they elect to connect to it. Uh, we're planning to do the pump station regardless because as town builds out, that will become more important. But those are in the next year or two. I was wondering anything a little further out down the road. Anything come to mind, Michelle, about beyond uh, replacements and upgrades? Not until that um, the Elk River plant is. is um, Okay. All right. Thank you. Those are my questions. Okay. Any questions, then? Kathy, ask my question. Okay. Joella or Robin? Okay. Um, just to provide some context related to the EQR discussion, um, we've been doing some preliminary modeling 
um, with with uh, John and with our uh, engineers on sort of what's the EQR demand from Brown Ranch. Um, so the total, at least as of right now, and this is obviously subject to a little bit of more massaging, is that the total would be fifteen fifty. Um, for total build out. For total build out. Um, and so, you know, we talk about that that first phase being eleven to twelve hundred. That would fit within that eight hundred EQR threshold. Um, probably just within it, and that's part of why that first phase is scaled yeah. to that. Yeah. Well, it's scaled to that number because we were sort of tying it to that is the sort of first natural threshold um, that would be uh, that, you know, we would have to cross if that makes sense. So you feel like you could get through <clears throat> phase one without triggering the essentially half the plant. project right before. Yeah, before the Elk River plant needs to be operational. Well, that doesn't mean that work doesn't need to be done and money needs to be spent mm -hmm. to get that going because it's a lot. It takes it takes time to get those things online. Um, so I agree with what John was saying as well, related to, we need to figure out how this is paid for and how it gets done, because it's a, it's a huge conversation for the resiliency of the community, the reliability of our water system in general, and facilitating the second half of the development of Brown Ridge. Um, so I, we definitely need to have that conversation of how it gets, how it gets built, but to answer your specific question about the how that first phase relates, it can be handled within that 800 EQR. It sounds like we have a little bit of even buffer to work with, uh, given the system upgrades that have either been done or are anticipated in the next couple of years. Right, and somewhere in here, I think the first phase included A, B, and part of C. Yep. Right. So that's a lot of units. That's good. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? On John's water presentation. Did you, hey, yeah, question, on. Jason. Uh, so I understand, John, that there's benefit in building the entire Elk River water supply infrastructure improvements, but there's benefit to the overall system, Correct. the overall community. And what we need to figure out then, the negotiation is going to be what percentage of that benefit is to the existing system mm -hmm. and what percentage benefits Brown Ranch directly. Right. Well, that's it's, if you go with the distribution modeling approach that you, I think, which was your number three option. That was, yeah. Right. So then that was my question. Is there a methodology to help us get there? Or are we just going to be throwing darts until it feels good? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. The methodology really is that option number three, where okay. uh, staff will do distribution system modeling to try to figure this out. That's what I thought. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. I think, I think you, we probably want to, figure out the question related to the STR tax utilization before we go down that road because of the limitations on the utilization of the STR tax. So if you say it's 100% Brown Ranch's responsibility, that's new affordable housing, that meets the, the criteria for utilization of STR tax, then you can utilize all of the STR tax to pay for that entire infrastructure, understanding that it has you know, additional benefits. Mm -hmm. Or it's a 60-40 split and only the 40 or 60% that is affected by Brown Ranch, then we have to back the numbers into that. Exactly. And then the, then the idea would be that, that the, whatever, that 40% that's not attributed to Brown Ranch and new affordable housing has to be paid for by the existing rate users and tax fees within the city, right? That's the other side of that. So... Um, well, I think that's where I think that's why having that conversation about the SCR tax utilization is important before you go down the road of analyzing. Yeah, but at the same point, we need to. I think if we have these options in front of us, and we kind of figure out which option works best for the Brown Ranch, for mm -hmm. you guys, and the whole community, then we have those numbers, and we kind of look then. At, I don't want the STR money to drive all of these conversations. It should be what is right for the development and for the community. And then it backs into where's the money coming from? What's fair and equitable? 
and then work it back from there. And maybe it's 100 percent, and maybe it's 60 40. You know, we don't know sure. what the number is yet. Right. But I, I, I think saying we have a million dollars, how are we going to spend it? Oh, let's make the numbers work so we can spend it all on this project. I think that's, I don't think the community would appreciate that very much. Sure. And, and we don't. We don't know if it's a million dollars or, you know, 10 bucks at this point. So I, I would, I would anxiously await the study mm -hmm. because I also think that our, our current community needs to understand if it's going to be called on to pay increased rates then it is not that they are sponsoring Brown Ranch. Is there any way you can get a finer definition of the cost of the Elk River? Because the difference between 40 and 58 million is you can drive a truck through it. <laughs> That's cool and dark, Kathy. Yeah. Well, I know, but even, well, in today's money, I mean, we, Ray is just, I mean, they just finished so finishing a wastewater facility and they are putting in a new water treatment facility. So they've got today numbers. I don't know what their capacity is or anything, but if we, I, I can't imagine we can't get today numbers. I think the, the loose end is the cost of the acquiring easements. Yeah, and the property and building. And the building, yeah. yeah. Not the, not the, we know what a, a treatment plant costs. We don't know what it's going to cost to acquire the land. Right. Well, and that was one of my comments was start looking, start negotiating the land now. It's only going to go up. Kathy, are you thinking net present value? Is that what you're thinking? No, I'm thinking okay. more kind of along the word. Uh, I mean, I know land along the Elk River is mm -hmm. highly desirable. Right. And so, you know, if we're going to need it as a community, regardless, whether it's 20 years or 40 years out, as Robin said, we should start looking at. Thank you. Right. And I think the sequencing of, of events, I think the sequencing of expenses and projects is probably important to understand for the purpose of this group. Because I'm certainly interested. I mean, because there's you you don't just go and build a plant tomorrow. You've got to do like probably 10 other things before you're ready to build the plant. So what are those and what do you suppose the cost will be? Well, that's pretty, you laid that out pretty well. Yeah, yeah, there's a brief outline of that. Right. Yeah. Yes. So the I mean, threshold question here is, you know, who's going to pay for this and in what percentages, basically. Mm -hmm. But I assume at this point, staff, you haven't had a chance to present this to all city council, so we don't have any. And, and, you, and basically what I heard from you earlier, you want to wait to see this water demand analysis before um, is that before any recommendations are made and before the city will have a proposal ready for that or? Yeah, yeah, that, exactly. Uh, okay. Our demand analysis and then uh, sounds like there is some uh, uh, enthusiasm to do the distribution system modeling. So we'll do that as well. Right. Call us as a is that correct from the housing authority perspective? Mm -hmm. Distribution modeling is we're feeling yeah. comfortable with that. I mean, obviously we need to see how the modeling works out, but yeah. Theoretically, that sounds like a, an approach you're willing to. I mean, I think it's good for, like, as you mentioned, like describing the value that it provides to Brown Ranch and the development of affordable housing there and the benefits that it provides to the entire system. There is some break, there's some share of that, right? And we've talked about that in non specific terms for a while. Um, it'd be good to get an understanding of what, whether it's 60, 40, or 25, 75, or whatever. And and you feel you can work on that modeling in in house internally yeah. and and collaborate with the housing authority to work on that model. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. We can. I mean, we can circle up on timing to make yeah. sure we can get that together. And that way, in right. April, maybe we can be at a decision point. Yeah. And the other piece of that is once we kind of come up with something. And Jim, I know you're raising your hand, but we can public comment at eleven thirty. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I didn't see you so raising your hand. Yeah, we it's do public comment. So this there. particular discussion, it, it'll take me just a few seconds. It's, that's, yeah, that's, I've, I've been instructed, that's what this group wants us to do. So, so um, my question, uh, comment more so is we get all this information, we make a decision, 
we take it back to our groups and everything. We let the community understand it. And then we're doing a rate study next year anyway, right? So that plays into oh, yeah. the next rate study analysis mm. for the city completely. So it all kind of flows nicely. Okay. So that's very good. Okay, cool. And that's good information. Also in your presentation, John, you had the water conservation right. discussion. Um, I, I, any any feedback from Housing Authority on commitment to using these approaches to help water conservation? Yeah, I mean we're we're all in. Uh, that was something we heard loud and clear from the community that they that they want to see. One of the major water conservation, uh, I'd say, land use planning to uh, take that sort of top bullet point there mm -hmm. is is just a, a significant reduction in private yards. Okay. And more focus on common green space, open space, irrigated turf space that um, you know has the opportunity to either be you know essentially centrally managed, if that makes sense. So it's not 800 yards, it's one park. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's also, um, something where we can, we can look at the feasibility of using raw water for irrigation so that we aren't creating that draw on the, um, treated on the treated water system. So like, we're open to all, all of those things. We think that's the direction that we need to be going with Brown Ranch, with everything in the city that I know the city's done a really good job of transitioning a lot of their parks to raw water irrigation that's made a big difference in uh in water consumption um so we're yeah, we're, we're open to all of those concepts okay and john i assume that would play implementing these type uh, of things would impact the eqr analysis as well correct right mm -hmm. yeah especially uh, for outdoor <clears throat> irrigation mm -hmm. yeah and i think that the water budget concept is probably the best so that we have that creates sort of flexibility to you know utilize both utilize monitoring to know what water we're actually using and, and confirm that we truly are a quarter of an eqr or maybe we're 20 percent of an eqr we're doing better than we thought and then and then secondly it allows you to do other things like integrate raw water irrigation to reduce EQR usage and maybe utilize that for more dwelling units or something along those lines. I think that's that's the type of uh, flexibility that we're thinking about with a commitment towards, you know, making sure that we're uh, monitoring what that water usage is and then being very deliberate about when and where we use water. I have a question about the water reuse capabilities. What exactly does that mean? Great water. Just using the gray water. Yeah, I was gonna say probably like rainwater, storm water, mm -hmm. harvesting is would be oh, a okay. specific way to say that too. But sure. because I thought I had been told in the past that we weren't supposed to be harvesting rainwater. We were supposed to allow it to go into the ground. Yeah, and that, that rule system. changed um a couple years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, right. yeah. it's been a long time. Yeah. That stuff yeah. is very okay. I'm encouraged now. So that all gets included in all the analysis is, you know, how much snow we get and everything, but that maybe a certain percentage of it used to go back and now that percentage is less because more people are harvesting what we're doing, whatever. Yeah, and the way to monitor that is through the water budget agreement. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think what we can do is create some assumptions on what we think we're going to do, but ultimately we sort of have to like verify that we're doing the right thing and if we're not we need to be investing in more you know that we're using less water and if not we need to be investing in more conservation um so that we can meet that sort of water budget um as we as we develop out but i think um you know we can we can put into this agreement and all of that whatever the issues are but we're ultimately going to need to be like verifying and um and then you know adjusting as necessary. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can I, I think those the, the second and third bullets is kind of really where ICS had it is having a, a specific water conservation and efficiency plan 
um, that has a water budget agreement as part of that. And so maybe in terms of the annexation agreement, it just says, hey, we're going to do these are what we need to do. And, yeah. okay. and then the specifics of the commitments we've got. Okay. Just wanted to uh, help manage expectations here. And I think those concepts are all spot on, Jason. Uh, they've been around uh, for a while with new organism development, which is kind of old organism now because it's been around, it's been around decades. <laughs> but um, I think it's important for folks to know that if you are, kids are going to want a place to go play. And if you're sharing a private courtyard to do that, you need an entity to manage that. It's usually an HOA to do that. And so um, when you're developing these private courtyards for multifamily or single family, and minimizing yards, uh, typically you're going to need an HOA to maintain those. So I think it's important to note that uh, because the city will not be able to go in and manage and maintain hundreds of private courtyards in this development. Pocket parks, yes. Open space, yes. Uh, regular sized parks. But if you're doing those private courtyards, much like you see in uh, Central Park in Denver, there's a lot of them around there. And uh, there are HOAs that pay for those, for that maintenance. The yards are small. Uh, they pay for it, um, but it's packed with kids and parents out there every weekend. And the kids need a place to play. Cool. So <laughs> as far as um, putting some of these items into an annexation agreement, has Housing Authority, have you been working on a kind of a comprehensive water conservation and efficiency plan with those commitments and water budget agreement? Have you been, have you been looking at things like that? Uh, we have not worked on any like water budget agreements or anything like that. We do have a lot of stuff in our community development plan about water conservation, about our efforts to reduce water utilization. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think I think a lot of this conversation is going to roll into the parks conversation mm -hmm. um, because the buildings themselves, as far as the fix, you know, fixture counts and all of that, they're relatively it's a pretty simple calculation. You know what I mean? Like everyone uses low flow toilets now, but you just can't buy like high flow toilets. They just don't exist. Um, but the, uh, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's really going to become a conversation about volume of units and outdoor irrigation. Is that fair? I totally agree. Okay. The one thing I think the community and I know council will be interested in, we've had the general conversation is saying in this agreement that we will develop a water conservation and efficiency plan and we will have a water budget agreement might not cut it. I think they're going to want an outline of what those are going to be. Maybe not the specifics, but to say that we, we anticipate our, our goals are um, we water conservation should be at a certain percent. I don't know, but I think it's not just going to be to say, yeah, we're going to do it. It's got to be, there's got to be more substance to it than that. So I think we need to think about that and we can take that back and talk to So the expectation areas. would be at least some high level commitments on exactly. major categories. Obviously, we're not going to dive into no. the minutia. And you can't, right? Because it's going to change. But to right. say we will do it, I don't think it's going to cut the mustard. Oil. Yeah, and I, I would urge you guys to take a look at the um, the details that we've provided from the plan. Um, there's really good stuff about our, sort of our sustainability framework related to water. Um, it's in the rainbow packet. It's also uh, on pages 108 to 113 of the Brown Ranch Community Development Plan. So uh, it talks about use of low flow fixtures in all buildings, minimizing external hose bibs, minimizing water use, uh, you know, during high demand periods, uh, considering rain barrels. So I, I think we're on track with everything that we're talking about here. I don't think there's any, I don't think we have any disagreements in focusing on water conservation for all of the reasons that it's a good idea. Right. Okay. Well, affordability is our first goal. Sustainability is our second. Yep. So we're totally on board. Okay. So maybe then we, and I don't know who the right people are from each uh, housing authority in the city, but we need to have those people who are really well versed in these in, conser in water conservation, these efforts to start working on some draft language to incorporate into the annexation agreement. Um, so maybe if staff could collaborate city and housing authority on working on that draft language, that would be great. 
And then as far as moving the ball forward on the water overall, yeah, particularly the Elk River water supply discussion, what I heard from the group is we have pretty good agreement that the distribution you know, modeling is, is what we want to look at. Um, we don't we don't know exactly where those percentages will shake out yet, but that's that's the direction you're, we're going and staff will begin working in the city and collaborate with housing authority staff to work on that model and hopefully have, have a model ready by the April time frame when we'll have that water demand analysis, which will really help finalize the discussion. Mm -hmm. Does that sound fair, Leah? Yeah, that sounds fair. Um, and I just wanted to follow up on the water budget agreement. Is that something that the city has with other developers' language that we could potentially look at? So that we, I mean, I'm all for entering into one, but I was just wondering if there's a document that we can start reviewing in advance of the April meetings to get a better sense of what Michelle's saying no. Yeah, we did not. No, we, we don't, but it's you know it's a it's a best practice that's heavily promoted by the state right now. So I mm -hmm. think this is a great opportunity to okay one. And then is the city going to take the lead on potentially putting together language for that? Why, why don't we find another community and yeah. let's let's yeah, not there's a, there's the there's wheel a here. lot of resources okay right now to, to give us examples on how to do this okay. but the city feels comfortable taking the lead on that part to what well, so <laughs> like, uh, yeah. yes yes okay yeah and i think it's just important that we know who's who's kind of taking you know yeah. taking mm -hmm. the ball on that lead and obviously both housing authority and city staff will work together on it but somebody needs to take the lead so thank you Okay, um, so I think that's a plan as far as how we move the water discussion forward. Was there anything else, John, you wanted direction on on that part or no. key discussion? No, I'm good on water. I, I just want to thank the city because they have been very diligent about expanding their water capacity over the last three or four years. And that's made a lot of difference in this conversation. Mm -hmm. We would not be having such a casual conversation if uh you didn't have that storage right on the elk and and you know uh, so took a lot of time good great <laughs> it was years yeah i mean yeah. it's it, it takes years to put all this stuff together so like great foresight i just want to thank you guys for, for the hard work on that part thank you appreciate it okay john should we move to wastewater let's move to wastewater okay so you have this aerial in your packet, and uh, what this aerial shows is, if I if you see my cursor here, the wastewater treatment plant is this facility down here in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, the Yampa River is, of course, right here. And then we have uh, Heritage Park and Steamboat 2. And then the Brown Ranch property is everything north of the highway right here. And there is a topographical divide that kind of bisects the Brown Ranch property that, from a wastewater perspective, uh, divides it into an eastern basin and a western basin. The offsite infrastructure for the eastern basin is already built and in place, and it's this yellow line right here. And this yellow line is a trunk line that uh, the city has built over the years uh, to enable development uh, within. Uh, Overlook Park subdivision, as well as the eastern basin of Brown Ranch. So all that is in and ready to go. Um, and then in the western basin, there are basically three options for how to service this wastewater. Uh, option one, which will probably be the preferred option, is that you gather it into some sort of central low point and then you pump it up over that topographical divide and dump it into the eastern basin. Uh, to do that, the engineers for the housing authority will have to assess the capacity of the pipeline system uh, in order to convey that. That will probably be the preferred option. The other option um, would be to convey flows through the Steamboat 2 Metro District. Now, this would involve uh, working with Steamboat Metro District. You'd have to get their agreement to do it. And you would probably end up uh, looking at upsizing pipelines through Steamboat 2. Uh, because Steamboat 2 does have a system that ends up down at the treatment plant. And then the third option is an independent option, which is basically gathering it in some low point, crossing the highway, crossing the river, and coming down with a separate pipeline to the plant. 
topographically that may be infeasible uh, if you're familiar with that drive. There is a bit of a cliff there going down to the river, so that could be a challenge to convey waste water flows through. But anyway, point being, the offsite infrastructure for the eastern basin is in place, and the western basin is to be determined. Uh, going back again to key questions that staff anticipates that the community would have is uh, what infrastructure improvements are necessary? Uh, when will the need, treatment plant need to be expanded? And is this going to affect my monthly bill or my tap fees? So uh, we covered number one in that previous slide. Uh, the infrastructure improvements are pretty much in the ground ready to go for that eastern basin, uh, western basin to be determined. The next slide, we will get into the treatment plant, uh, how much capacity we have and when it will need to be expanded. At our wastewater treatment uh, plant, we have three different parameters that govern capacity. We have the high season flow, which you can think of as runoff season. And Gilbert, that's what, May through June? Okay, where- uh, March. March. March through June, where we can have 7.5 million gallons per day of capacity. We have low season flow, which is all the rest of the months, which is 5 million gallons per day of capacity. And then we have what's called loading, which is 9,600 pounds per day. What loading is, is it's a measure of the strength of the wastewater. It is biochemical oxygen demand, and it's the quantity of oxygen that bacteria produce while uh, eating away at the wastewater. And we have the capacity for 9,600 pounds per day. We're currently at 73% of our capacity. The state mandates how we have to quantify this. They say that we have to use a peak month, and that is a 30-day uh, average. Right now, our peak month is March of 2021, and uh, that's when we hit our 73% threshold. Um, the state also mandates that at 80% of capacity, you have to start designing your plant uh, capacity increases. And at 90% capacity, you have to start constructing your increases. So those are all laid out in state statute. Um, so if we assume that the city and Mount Warner to continue to build out at our historical rates, which is about 110 EQRs per year, and if we assume that Brown Ranch uh, delivers the first unit in 2026 and that Brown Ranch delivers 200 EQRs per year, which I understand are aspirational or stretch goals, but are, they're good goals for the city to uh, plan around, then we'd be looking at designing the expansion in 2027 and constructing the uh, expansion 10 years from now in 2033. And I'll say all of this with the caveat that this is provided that state mandates do not change. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are uh, governed, we are regulated by the state health department, which in turn is regulated by the EPA. If they uh, end up saying, hey, you can't use loading anymore as your capacity, you have to use low season flow or something along that nature, then we'll have to go back and reassess. But uh, typically they give you a four to five year runway for that kind of thing as they issue their new permits. Is that fair, Gilbert? Yes. Um, so again, wastewater discussion, much shorter than the water discussion, but uh, what infrastructure improvements are necessary? Basically, you're looking at uh, expansion of the wastewater treatment plant. When will it need to be expanded? Again, it's something we have to continuously monitor. Everybody out there has a different opinion on rate of growth. So again, monitor and assess. But uh, with current assumptions, we're looking at 2033. Um, and then will monthly bills or tap fees change as a result of that Brown Ranch? Uh, as Robin mentioned previously, we are doing a rate study next year, which will take a deep dive into all of our expected costs that will help us design our rates. But uh, no your monthly bills will not change as your monthly sewer bills will not change as a result of ground range because uh, it's all the uh, incremental costs to treat ground ranch are no greater than the incremental costs to serve the rest of the city will tap fees change maybe uh, tap fees could change if we have to expand the treatment plant quicker 
So if we look at a 20 year threshold, it could be worst case scenario that TAP fees in, uh, increase by $2,000 per EQR uh, over the next 20 years uh, due to the expected increase from Brown Ranch. I would say that that is a uh, guesstimate at this point, and that that would be a number that would be refined next year during the rate study. So again, I wouldn't anticipate any change to monthly sewer bills as a result of Brown Ranch and uh, TAP fees, this would be for any new development, uh, could increase by maybe $2,000 per year. Um, and with that, that's all I have on wastewater. So okay. definitely easier discussion in water. And I'll turn okay. back over here. All right, any questions for John on the wastewater discussion? Is this the one between the two? I'm not remembering the diameter of the trunk lines. Is this one where we had you we in 2007 we put in the 15 inch diameter sewer trunk line? Mm -hmm. And then is there someplace else where it's a 12 inch or it's a nine inch that's coming into it? And or it we have to build something, it goes from 12 to nine. I can't remember what it was, but one's bigger and the other's smaller, and it seems it like it was in the opposite order. So uh, the smaller diameter pipes are upstream and the larger okay. diameter pipes are downstream. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. The other thing that drives your pipe diameter is the grade that the pipe is laid at. The steeper the pipe, the less uh, diameter you need for your pipe. Mm -hmm. So uh, the pipelines down by the plant are exceptionally large because they are flat. Mm -hmm. Very flat. Other questions for John? Well, so yeah. if the east side you know, yeah, how you talked about how it's going to, you know, East Basin is an Eastern Basin is in place. How many units? I mean, if we look at it mm -hmm. from this viewpoint, how much are we going to be able to build before we actually have to deal with the Western side? Probably 70% of the project. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's, there's, there's the neighborhood D is the sort of western neighborhood is the only one that really is impacted by that uh that threshold you're sort of teetering on the edge of that uh at that sort of middle of uh, neighborhood c mm -hmm. um but i think it's possible to get the most of that to flow back i'm not an engineer but <laughs> no but the fact that we can build yeah and we everything's in place yes. well, up to yeah, yep. really yep. great foresight once again. Well, it's already being used by KOA and Sleepy Bear, so it is active today. And then overlook will also tap into it because their sewer line goes right through there. Okay. So just to summarize your discussion, John, it's it's basically that um, you have to increase capacity based on these set state thresholds, yes. 80, 90 percent, et cetera. <laughs> Um, but you're saying basically the community should not expect any change in their monthly bills right. for, for sewer uh, based on this um, annexation. However, tap fees may change going forward based on the rate study, and obviously bills could change based on the rate study yeah. just based on you know changes in costs and upgrades sure. necessary for for regular treatment, etc. That's exactly right. Okay, and so it's safe to assume that if Brown Ranch projects pay their tap fees and we're good right correct okay and then they're going to be paying whatever the sewer rate is that everybody Just like else everybody is paying else. based on volume right, right. Yep. Any, any concerns with that authority i wish we could do everything like this <clears throat> right it's great okay the one question you may receive for constituents is should there be a different tap fee for Brown Ranch than there exists. That is the one question you may receive from them. Um, and why would a different tap fee be appropriate? Just talk about that. People who hold that view would say that you will reach your growth threshold quicker. Mm. Uh, it, so the accelerated timing of the expansion would drive the desire to have a higher tap fee. Um, I, I'm not sure I would. Uh, support that I would say keep it all the same but because for for the purpose of the water wastewater treatment plant growth is growth they don't care but the income of the people right. they don't it doesn't care the <laughs> location it's just sewage running down to the plant and filling up that capacity 
So it could be units at the base area, the ski area. Could be, you know, uh, you know new city hall uh, or, you know, whatever. Um, all of that stuff is contributing to that capacity. Yeah, TAPIs are designed uh, such that new development buys their way into the capacity system. And so it's not more expensive for the city to serve any topographical area out there, whether it be Brown Ranch, uh, Steamboat 2, Mount Warner, Blue Sage Circle, who knows? It's, it's all the same to us. Okay. So any concerns with the tap piece just being the same for everyone or? I, not at the moment. Right. Yeah, I think we have to listen to public comment. Sure. And we have to take it back. You know, we might hear more concerns as opposed to you guys with your board, but it it, it makes sense the way it's set up. Yeah. Okay. This was a softball. <laughs> <laughs> or a, so that means when we get to it, this is right. the one we're going to do first, right? We're going to win before we go to the nitty gritty. Okay. Store water. Okay. John, any other feedback? Any other concerns on wastewater? No. Okay. okay. So, yeah, let's talk about waste or uh, stormwater. So, stormwater, if the last one was a softball, this is a wiffle ball. Um, <laughs> now, in all honesty, though, stormwater is a hit to the budget. It is not part of the Tabor Enterprise Fund. It is part of the general fund. Uh, maintenance and upkeep, you're, it, we uh, assume a cost of about $1.2 million a year for stormwater citywide right now. Um, our streets division uh, maintains the existing stormwater system, and our engineering division is charged with oversight of the functionality of the stormwater system. And when I say stormwater, I'm basically talking about drainage in general. I actually don't have a presentation on this because the annexation committee does not have to weigh in on this if you don't want to. You can choose not to mention stormwater in the annexation agreement, and it will basically then run with existing codes and existing policies. And from a staff standpoint, that's fine. The only reason you would need to mention stormwater in your annexation agreement is if there, if there is a reason to change what we're already doing. So in your packet uh, under stormwater, there's a section on rules and responsibilities. Um, I think that's what I, we end up calling it. Uh, and in that, we outline who do, does what, or yeah, section two rules and responsibilities, the city responsibilities versus the initial developer responsibilities versus the private property owner responsibilities. That is per existing city code. If the annexation committee wants to change that, uh, then you would want to mention that in the annexation agreement. But if you're satisfied with the rules and responsibilities as currently outlined, you don't have to mention anything in the annexation. Um, I will say that uh, uh, staff is excited to see the housing authority take a regional approach to their stormwater. Right now in Steamboat Springs, stormwater is not addressed on a regional basis. It's addressed on a site-specific basis. So all new developments you see have these kind of little detention ponds sitting next to them. But if you take it on a more regional basis, it can be more cost-effective. It can use less property. And it, it enables you to uh, double up the use with some other use, perhaps uh, as parkland or some other beautification effort. So we like the direction that they're going with this regional stormwater approach. But again, for the annexation committee, it boils down to section two roles and responsibilities. If you want to change that, uh, we can talk about this uh, probably as these negotiations continue and put a clause in the annexation agreement. Otherwise, you can stay silent in the annexation agreement and we won't do it business as usual. I think it impacts the the fiscal impact model a little bit because most of these are planned on being within the sort of parks and open space, which is the whole point of regional attention is that you can get double utilization of it as opposed to having an unusable bathtub next to your apartment complex. Um, and uh, and so, yes, I think probably the key aspect here is if it's in the park system, who's maintaining the parks? And the stormwater could be, could be the same, could be different. That's really the, the 
crux of the conversation here. But as far as like how much we provide and all of that, it's the city's got a great system uh, for stormwater that is already within the regulatory framework that we would just be happy to utilize. And it's going to change over time based on new technology and all that. I think it's the appropriate way to do it. Does it hurt to at least mention that we intend to comply with all current rules and regulations? And that way people don't say, well, you didn't talk about it. I think Certainly. so. Maybe just an acknowledgement. Yeah. 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 Yes. But then to your point, when we get to Parks and Rec, then that's where we have the conversation about the water. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, and it's going to be. It's not as simple as like, oh, this is clearly a stormwater <laughs> responsibility because it's going to be like essentially very low lying basins that are maybe a sports field. That in the case of a, a huge walk, you know, runoff right. event or rain event, fill up with water for a period of time and then slowly discharge. And so it's not going to be as super simple as saying, like, that's clearly a drainage thing that's on X or it's so anyhow, I think that's where we're gonna want to have a little bit more conversation about that. Um, and we have some, you know, some examples of what we um, you know, what we intend to do, that map that you have there. It's just sort of a an idea of sort of the off channel um, stormwater management concepts that we're working with based on the different basins as John was talking. Okay. Any concerns with going with the regular the standard regulatory approach on stormwater? But, but to Kathy's point, you know that we just we have a we acknowledge it. It. yeah, and the fact that we acknowledge the fact that if it changes over time, that it will be, you know, you'll it will work within the new framework. Yeah. Or different framework, which yes. everybody's required to do. Yeah, yeah, and the just one of the things related to mm -hmm. the storm, the regional stormwater approach, is that we won't have to have on-site detention. So you actually can utilize the full, a full block of development for the development itself, as opposed to having to create a space for stormwater detention. It can happen. Offsite, uh, which is what doesn't currently happen in the city. Okay. Does that affect at all if you're able to move forward with your geothermal team? This is an aside. I'm sorry, but I'm just, you know, we're going to dig how many thousands of holes probably. And I'm not sure it's going to have any effect okay. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah, the geothermal is going to be way far underground compared okay. to this. Next meeting, uh, we're slated to talk about streets for part of the discussion. Right. Our streets division performs stormwater maintenance. So we'll uh, we will look a little bit more into stormwater maintenance at our next meeting, how streets does it and how it's funded. Okay. And I think from the funding of or the, the who performs the maintenance, our objective with a lot of these things is, is who's the most efficient at doing that job? Um, because we're just spending community resources, right? Of, you know, the city's paying for it or the housing authority is paying for it or uh, the residents in Brown Ranch are paying for it, whoever it might be. Like, this is just like, we need to figure out who's the most efficient at providing that level of service. And, and my goal would be to start there because we don't necessarily need to create a streets crew and a stormwater crew when you guys have a have one that can you know, that we can invest more resources in and have them perform that job that they're already very good at doing in you know uh you know just another larger area if that makes sense so that's sort of our initial concept around a lot of those thoughts um is to think about who does that the best right now and see how we can make sure that they have the resources to continue to do that if that makes sense from an ongoing maintenance and operations. Now, right now, stormwater maintenance is dictated by property ownership. So the city maintains everything uh, that's put on city property or uh, right of way or you know, city easement. But if it's located on private property, then mm -hmm. that, the, easement, the maintenance is performed by the private property. Mm -hmm. Or not. 
<laughs> or neglected by the private party. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's but a problem. Their response. That's a problem that, that we have within the city right now is that a lot of those private dispersed stormwater facilities aren't really very well managed. As part of our MS4 permit, we are required to enforce that. So yeah. that, that is something that we get after. Okay. So the point what, what the point is that you're trying to make is we probably need to have a conversation somewhere in this as to even whether the city would want to be responsible for all of the stormwater maintenance within Brown Ranch, possibly with a fee being charged to the housing authority to do it so that you don't have to do it. I mean, we're, I think we're just open to figuring out who's the most effective at doing it and what the, and how to get the resources to that organization. I, you know, when there's a fee, we're open to all these different. That's not something we have to talk about. Well, that's, totally. yep. that's a little bit opposite of what we just said then, it because is. Is. basically what we just said five minutes ago was we're going to follow the codes and regulations as they exist. But now we're talking about something that's not that. Well, what I'm hearing from Jason is he wants the experts to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And he's inferring that the experts are the city when in fact the city traditionally throughout the community does not take care of it. Mm -hmm. Does that become a contract with the city? Right. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, maybe that could be a post annexation, uh, you know, thing Something if we just handle, about. handle it by land ownership, um, which is the way it is handled now, which is the way it's handled now. And if there is some collaboration that can save resources, then, then we could look at that. But that would be sort of a down the line conversation. Not so that we're not changing up the sort of what we literally just agreed to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although, aren't we deeding the parks to this? I mean, theoretically, aren't we deeding the parks to the city? And then if our water storage basins are part of our parks, then doesn't the city do that? Oh, right. If, that, I mean, if that's the direction that we go on parks. I think that's something we all, that's yes. for the conversation right. when we get to parks. Yes. <laughs> so it adds, it adds a layer of complexity to the, to the discussion, discussion on, park. on yes. park land dedication. Yes. Well, but for purposes of the current stormwater regulations, it's city park. Does the city handle yes. stormwater issues related to that? We do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. So I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, does the group feel comfortable with? It seems like a pretty big discussion. I, I don't, do you really want to save that discussion for later? Because this seems pretty important that you you're agreeing to follow the regulations as they exist. But it sounds like there's some potential appetite for a later discussion. Which is that the appropriate time, or is now the appropriate time? It seems like now would be. Well, and how much time do we have for? How much time are we given for parks? How many meetings are we going to go through parks? Stuff? And is that really what's driving this? Is the parks component? That's well, I, it just so happens that you want to co-locate these with parks because that's the best practice related to um, regional stormwater. So you can get dual usage from from these facilities because ninety nine percent of the time they're not filled with water, and so now you get to utilize them as a green space or whatever it might be. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, you know, our, if you look at, if you look at the stormwater concepts overlaid with the parks, it's essentially the exact same um, as far as the land that would be parks and or open space within the plant. So there would be, if we took the uh, business as usual approach and we deeded the parks and open space to the city, there would be that that would mean that the city would then be responsible for the stormwater so i think we need to have a real presentation on this as to what it all entails as opposed to making or having a conversation today without any information yeah to it feels like we're kind of stepping ahead on to the parks and open space discussion which i know is coming up on a future we agenda but, but what i'm hearing is at least conceptually at a high level the group is comfortable with the with the following the status quo and the regulations as they currently exist. And we'll get into some more 
meaty discussion on this when we get to the parks and rec or parks and open space discussion to see if there's any potential change to responsibilities there. I'd like to know more about it. Yeah. And usually I see separate detention basins and collection yeah. basins. I, I, it's a new concept to me that if we have an event, we flood our parks. We I, probably I, want to hear from I haven't heard that yet. So. Like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So when we get to the parks, our parks open space so, discussion, let's be sure to note this on the presentation. Well, okay. I mean, it's it's not unheard of to see Emerald Park completely underwater, right? It is in the spring. In the spring, right? <laughs> yeah. And this spring, particularly yeah, the spring. Swimming pool. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, all right. Okay, so John, anything else you wanted to cover on storm stormwater, wastewater, water? No, I have nothing else to present, but uh, we can be helpful answering questions. So. Any other questions from the group on, on these topics right now? Okay, so what I heard based on our discussion today, I'll just kind of go backwards. Stormwater, we're going to follow the current regulations and codes as they exist. Um, would we be able to, for our next meeting, could we start updating the annexation agreement draft to acknowledge yes. that piece? And then also for wastewater, I heard we were just agreeing as of now that you know, tap fees should cover the cost of, uh, of the, any necessary upgrades uh, to the wastewater treatment plant. And could we just confirm that in, in the updated annexation agreement draft as well, just relating to we'll just follow the tap fee approach on that. And as far as the water uh, discussion goes, we we agreed that we would the group would work on this and, and work on this distribution modeling approach where there would be some kind of split between the city and the housing authority on paying for the, the significant Elk, Elk River water supply upgrade. Uh, we don't know what those percentages are yet, but the two staffs will work together on that distribution modeling approach uh, and really we'll need to not only have that, but also once we get that water demand analysis report, which is slated hopefully for April, that will help us with um, finalizing the language around the water uh, uh, discussion and particularly in the annexation agreement. And maybe we could at least start working on a rough outline, even if it has some blanks on that we're agreeing to this distribution modeling approach. And we also discussed under the water headline, the, all the water conservation options that John listed, all those sounded acceptable. Uh, so if we could start uh, crafting some language around those water <laughs> conservation options and that the city will start taking the lead on the water budget draft and collaborate with housing authority on finalizing that. Those were kind of the highlights I had from water, wastewater and stormwater discussion today. Did I leave anything out that we need to at least start drafting language on for the draft annexation agreement? I think the big one that we sort of skipped over was the water rights dedication policy. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's circle back to and that. And whether that is something the city is intending to um, implement in this, uh, in this case or not, it would be the First question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and John, maybe what you could just uh, and remind everyone what the city's water rights dedication policy is. The water rights dedication policy requires any uh, annexed development or any new development over 50 EQRs uh, outside the city limits to either bring water rights to the table equal to 110% of their water demand or to pay a fee in lieu for water rights so mm -hmm. that the city can then go get them. Uh, it is entirely up to city council's discretion as to how or when to exercise that. Uh, but it was developed back in 2008 to run with the uh, uh, adequate water supply for development policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so then the question will be is, is whether the city is going to require it sounds like based on our discussion from water earlier, we have the water rights developed from the uh, Steamboat Lake water contract we mentioned earlier. That's correct. Um, so the question is whether really you'd be looking to the housing authority for a fee in lieu. That's right. essentially what I'm hearing. Correct. Yeah, because we don't have any water rights. Right. That may be a question that uh, you two want to take back to the rest of the council. Okay. 
Dan, that's something we'll probably want to do in the executive session. Yes. With good background information. Yeah, that's a good catch. Thanks for that. So city will follow up on its uh, stance on the water rights dedication policy and whether the fee and lien will be required. So I assume the housing authority is not interested in trying to go buy some water rights. So. <laughs> I believe, as Kathy said, our first goal is affordable. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. Okay, so we'll follow up on that piece as well. Was there anything else that we that needed to be addressed that we didn't cover on the water, wastewater, or stormwater? Don't remember anything else that we would have missed. And I know obviously we have some work to do on the distribution modeling and water demand analysis, but any other key items missed? No. Okay. Nothing else? Okay. Anything else from Housing Authority, City? Anything else from the committee on today's discussion? Here, let's just check with staff to see if you all are thinking on either side. Did we miss any major points? Yeah. Hey, tell us that nice. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Well, then, in that case, we've wrapped up a little bit early, so we will go to public comment. Public comment is scheduled for 30 minutes, and it shall begin at 11.30 a.m. or the conclusion of the above agenda items, whichever comes first. Those addressing the committee are requested to identify themselves by name and address. All comments should not exceed three minutes, and all comments shall relate only to topics of discuss a discussion on today's agenda. Anybody in here for public comment? Jim, did you have public comment for us? If you could give us your name and address, and we'll give you three minutes. My name is Jim Engelkin. I'm at 750 Pamela Lane. Um, you missed a very key component in your water discussion, your distribution model. Uh, to remind you, when it comes to water, there is no whole community here. There is a very hard line between the Mount Warner Water District and the city. When you talk about cost sharing, from the city to the Brown Ranch, or what some people may call um, something else. But the Mount Warner Water District will not help you pay. You are setting up the existing city uh, service area for higher costs because the Mount Warner Water District will not pay. You don't have the ability to force them to pay. This is not one community when it comes to water. Please don't lose sight of that. I don't know how you get the Mount Warner Water District to help out. It's a good question for Dan, and I suspect it involves a long needed heavy duty legal action, but that's a whole nother topic. But the idea that this is one community that is gonna help out with the Brown Ranch and cost sharing is just not real. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right. Anybody else in here? I don't think there's anybody else in, public for, in here for public comment. Anybody online for public comment? Let's see. Well, if anyone else in public would like to make comments, I don't see anybody with their hand up online. Okay. And nobody else in here? <clears throat> All right, so I'll close public comments. Um, John, did you want to follow up on the, the comment about the Mount Werner versus city district and whether the the uh, it could cause just the city district rates to go up? Yeah, Mr. Engelkin is correct in that uh, it is two separate water districts and the city has no authority to impose a, a, a sort of water rate on the Mount Werner. Um, in the context of these discussions, staff certainly was not intending to ask Mount Warner for any assistance. Uh, when we uh, spoke of one community, we were speaking in terms of our district, not Mount Warner. So we are not anticipating any financial assistance from them. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, can I just ask a follow up? Then Mount Warner is who is who. Who does Mount Water Water cover? For the most part, everything's south of Fish Creek. There's a very specific uh, dividing line 
but it more or less follows the creek. Okay. South. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how much of that's in the county versus the city? It's virtually all in the city. Okay. They only have a couple of properties that are in town lines. Yeah. Okay, cool. Skier in particular. Skier in. Jason, if oh, I can okay. make one more point to Robin, since she may not know. Current water rates for the city versus the uh, Mount Warner Water District for residential are currently roughly three to one. Mount Warner higher? City, city's, city's higher. higher. City's higher. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I think that wraps mm -hmm. us up. We still need to go over the next meeting. Yeah, I was going to do okay. that. Yep. Yeah, so next meeting, um, I understand, is the city is going to come back and talk to us about general municipal services. And yes. I understood that was going to focus on streets and any other specific topics. Transit. Streets and transit. Yeah. Okay. And you'll be leading that presentation, John? Correct. Okay. All right. And, and then we'll be including sort of excerpts from our plan related to those specific items okay could you we'll make with sure john and make sure those are noted in his presentation or or you... it'll be essentially just a separate like, an attachment yeah attachment that is uh basically our we're basically just chopping up the you know the 190 pages of the community development plan into bite-sized pieces so that you can digest those okay as we're talking about specific topics okay perfect Okay, and then of course, sooner rather than later, when we can get that, would be great. Um, and then, as far as also for follow up next week, we'll do our regular approval of minutes. We'll get the presentation on the community outreach plan, so we can discuss that in more detail. Um, and we'll also follow up on the water and wastewater and stormwater discussion from today. Hopefully, we can have some additional language on our draft annexation agreement, and even if it's, you know, it. Hopefully, it, hopefully it's as detailed as possible, but we still obviously have some holes to fill in on the, on the water with the demand analysis and the modeling, distribution modeling that we'll work on going forward. Jason, I do have a question for you yeah. about that. Um, is the expectation that we're providing language uh, in anticipation of what we're discussing next week, or are we just chasing what we've discussed today? I think we're, we want to see updated draft annexation agreement language based on what we just we discussed today. Okay, good. I, I'd, I'd rather not anticipate, you know, what we're going to talk about next week. So that no, no, measurement. right. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So we're doing it essentially post. Yeah. post yes, to reflect what we've discussed. And okay, what we agreed on, at least in a sort of a working draft concept. And that will then I guess be the document that we would review related to the previous. And this, so yeah, that's like we'll review. Uh, we obviously made our had our discussion today on water, wastewater, stormwater. We'll have our updated annexation agreement draft as part of the prior meeting recap. Got it. And we'll cover that as part of that. Okay. I think that's that's a good that's a good plan. And that should give time for feedback from each you know board and city council to see if there's any feedback to see if they have any concerns right outside of this committee yeah because conceivably you'd have the language in the packet that goes out right tomorrow or friday afternoon whatever well my, my guess is that might be a rainbow item this time for the annexation draft right uh for the for the for the meeting in two weeks yeah i it's not going to take me that long to put it together, but we'll have to do a little bit of internal review. So yeah, it's going to take it's going to take a couple of days at least. Okay. But it, we don't have a council meeting until the twenty seventh, so we'll have whatever it is in the council meeting packet in the exact section, so that we're looking at correct information to okay. get to get direction on for the twenty eighth. So it will, in my mind, this is a document that we'll have. Um, sort of the sign off as it were from the negotiating team, but not necessarily the whole council. So it will, you know, it will be necessarily contingent. Right. It's always contingent to further continuing review by yeah. the full housing authority body and the city council. But is the intention that we're going to present the language? Because I think on our side, you know, as this is a working document, we're going to continue to present it to our board. So we're getting feedback real time. Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think as you're ready to move along, and it certainly as it 
we have a presentation from you. If you're ready to propose your language, I think sooner rather than later is better. Okay. Yeah, I think the goal is, you know, this document is continually progressing forward. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's possible we may end up in a situation where the city's team does something that the rest of the council is not happy with, and we might have to take a step back. But the goal would be, you know, a series of steps forward after every meeting. Right. At the end, it should be edited as opposed to rated. Yeah, yes. right. Yeah. Hopefully in June, we have the it's document that just needs some fine tuning. Right. Okay. Anything else before we meet again on March 1st? You're good. All right. Then we're adjourned. See you on March 1st, 9 a.m. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.